Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Conservation Conversations. My name is Ana Sangronis, and I'm the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent here in Miami-Dade County. We welcome you to our webinar series, which is a joint effort between University of Florida IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be sent out within the next few days. You are all currently muted and your cameras are off, so we ask that you type in any questions you may have into the chat box, which will be moderated by my colleague Ed Pritchard and myself. If you would like to receive email updates about the future topics and registration links to these webinars, please indicate so in the chat box or you can email me. Ed is going to place my email address into the chat box. You can email me directly. So without further ado, I would like to present a first time presenter on this series, Sara Ortiz of Miami Eco Adventures, who is going to be discussing today about the wonderful charismatic mammal, the manatee. Take it away, Sara. Hi everyone. Thank you, Anna and Ed for the introduction. Um, my name is Sarah Ortiz. I am an interpretive program leader with Miami Eco Adventures, and today's presentation will be on manatees. So a little moment on manatees. So this is me. So just in case, um, I'll pop in my um, um, video at the end so you guys can see me and we'll talk a bit. Um, so today's topic again is a moment on manatees. Um, believe it or not, manatees have been around for more than 60 million years. Um, fossils have been discovered to prove their ancestry of these species. So if you look at that image on the right, um, you're gonna see right at the top, we have elephants, and then we have our dugongs and our manatees. And all the way at the bottom, we have our hyrexes. So how do we know this lineage existed? Well, there are shared characteristics. So first off, we have the incisors. So the incisors um, on the manatees are the teeth and on the elephants are their actual tusks. Um, the second one is lips. So the lips that are used to feed on the vegetation are actually similar to the trunks that the elephants use to forage their food. And then the third one are teeth. So manatee teeth are actually replaced by a horizontal forward movement. And that's the same process of dental development that occurs in manatee's mouth. And lastly, of the shared characteristics are toenails. So believe it or not, their toenails are on their flippers. So if you look at that image right on the top and it's exactly matches the toenails of elephants because they're short little nubs. So, and last but not least, we have the other closest relative to the manatees and that's the hyrax. So that's that picture on that bottom right. And it's a small golfer sized mammal they call it the rock rabbit or the daisy. But what's cool about all three of these species is that they're, they're all herbivores. So now that we know a little bit more of ancestry about these manatees, we're gonna talk about their family or more specifically their taxonomy. So all manatees fall under the kingdom Animalia and the phylum Chordata and class just like us animals. Um, their order is Sirenia which is why many people call them uh, sirens of the sea. That's where that comes from. It actually comes from their order. And there are families that set apart the manatees and the dugongs. And that's what you're seeing on the image on the right. So that top family consists of the West Indian manatee, the Amazonian manatee, and the West African manatee. And the family below, which is the dugondia, uh, includes dugons and the stellar sea cow. So for today's presentation, I'll be focusing on the West Indian manatee. Now, believe it or not, that 
um, species is actually split up into two subspecies, and it's going to be the Florida manatee and the Antillean manatee. Um, genetic studies have actually been done, um, and then they suggest that the Florida manatee are actually descended from the Antillean manatee, and they cross the Florida Straits from Cuba or the Greater Antilles. So it should be noted that unfortunately the stellar sea cow has become extinct. It became extinct around the 18th century due to hunters along with over harvesting of food. So short story, there was an increase in sea urchin population which triggered an increase of sea otters thus causing the decrease in that shallow water kelp beds that the sea cows fed on. So for today's presentation, we're gonna discuss their habitat, their distribution, a little bit of anatomy and physiology. So their behavior, their vision and hearing, communication, diet, reproduction, the threats that these manatees face, legal protection of everything, conservation of the species, and ultimately research programs that are helping improve the conservation of these manatees. So starting off with habitat. So manatees are found in shallow coastal waters, rivers, estuaries, bays, lakes, anywhere where there's seagrass beds and freshwater vegetation, that's where you're gonna find these manatees. They are unable to live in colder climates, but they do migrate to warmer waters during their winter season. Now for their distribution, which is other known as their range, these manatees are found in Southern Atlantic Ocean, all the way from North Carolina to Florida and the Gulf Coast. Um, these manatees are concentrated in Florida, especially during the winter. Um, during the summertime, the Florida manatees are spotted in southeastern states, so Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and these manatees have actually been documented as far west as Texas and as far north as Massachusetts. So a little bit about their anatomy and physiology. These manatees can actually grow to be nine to 10 feet long and weigh from 600 to 1,000 pounds. Just at birth, a calf, which is a baby manatee, is three to feet, three to four feet long and 60 to 70 pounds. So starting off with our image on the right, just follow these circles. Um, these large gray aquatic mammals, they have a whale-like body with a fluke, which is their tail at the end, giving them a, what I would say a chubby mermaid look to them. Then next up, they have these two forelimbs, which they're actually called their flippers. And like I said in that ancestry slide, they have nails at the end of their flippers, which is a unique characteristic. Next up is their face. It's often wrinkly with vibrissae, which is their whiskers um, near their nose. And another unique thing about manatees is that all over their body, they have hair just like humans. So going into that second image, um, their lungs. Their lungs actually serve multi-purpose as it's not only used for breathing, but also for buoyancy. So studies have shown that manatees can renew about 90% of the air in their lungs in a single breath as compared to humans who can only renew about 10%. Now let's get to their gut. So manatees are herbivores. So a large percentage of their body is taken up by their digestive tract. Since they feed on seagrass, which has a low nutritional value, they eat large quantities to compensate. So they rely on their gut microorganisms to help with their digestion. And last but not least, this is one of the most unique characteristics of all the mammals in the world, manatees and sloths are the only mammals with six cervical vertebrae. All the other mammals have seven, even giraffes. All right, so we're gonna get a little bit into behavior. So 
Manatees are passive, slow moving and a docile species. And they spend most of their time eating, resting and traveling. So if I were a species, I would love to be a manatee because all you have to do is eat, rest and travel. That's the greatest thing. So they spend approximately six to eight hours of their day feeding and they rest about two to 12 hours of their day. When traveling, they can swim up to speeds of three to five miles per hour, and they can do bursts of 15 miles per hour. They are able to stay submerged at the bottom or just below the surface of the water, and they come up every three to five minutes. However, if the manatee is using a great deal of energy, they may come up to breathe every 30 seconds. But overall, manatees are a semi-social species, but they're somewhat solitary. Um, they aggregate commonly due to their habitat. So their vision and their hearing. So manatees are able to distinguish um, between different size objects, colors, and patterns. They have known to respond to visual cues for up to 115 feet away. As for their hearing, they have large ear bones and can hear low frequencies. Whoops. Studies have shown that they have a greater sensitivity than any other marine mammal. They can, however, hear a wide range of frequencies, but in terms of sound localization, it isn't the best. In combination with hearing, a key component of manatee social behavior is communication. So manatees make sounds that are often described as chirps, whistles, and squeaks. Um, manatee mothers are often very vocal with their calves, so that's their babies. Um, vocalizations often express fear, anger, or mating. These vocalizations are produced at a frequency of about three to five um, kilohertz. Um, they're also used to keep contact, especially when manatees are feeding or traveling in turbid water. A research um, study was once reported that a mother and her calf separated by a floodgate and they vocalized constantly for three hours until they were reunited. So one of the most fascinating things about these herbivores is their diet. So they consume about 10 to 15 of their body weight in vegetation daily. So that is equal to 100 to 150 pounds of food a day. So imagine if you had to eat all this vegetation the entire day. So they do have a lot of options. So those top three, we have that manatee grass, turtle grass, and that shoal grass. That's typically what we find out in uh, Crandon Park. So that's you always see them typically, but they have an exceptional low metabolic rate. And, and an advantage to that is that they can withstand these cold temperatures, but anything below 20 degrees Celsius is lethal to them. The body temperatures of manatees is actually influenced by feeding. So a study done on manatees showed that the stomach temperatures actually dropped after 15 minutes once they started eating. So it's quite, it's cool how just the food that they put in their body has such an effect on their overall composition and just functioning. So here we go. We're going to do a quick short version of the manatee life cycle. So starting off at the top, a manatee is born and then they will stay with their mother for about two to three years old. Then once the female turns five years old, she's sexually mature. And once the male is nine years old, he's sexually mature. So then a female is approached by a mating herd, and this could be a group of a dozen or more. And that's what leads us to reproduction. So manatees have a low reproductive rate and they'll give birth to one calf every 
two to five years. It's very rare, but twins are a possibility. And they may give birth throughout the year, but typically they give birth during the summer and the mother's gestation period is about a year. Another unique characteristic about manatees is the way the calf feeds. So she feeds underneath um, what, so it's called a teat, but if you look at a manatee, it's gonna be like the armpit of her flipper. And so if you always see like in that video, you see how that calf is very close to the mom. That means she's probably still feeding and they still have that bond up until she reached that sexually mature age. Threats. So manatees have a lifespan of about 60 years, but due to threats, their lifespan barely passes 30 years. First one is natural mortality. This is commonly due to cold-related diseases, gastrointestinal disease, pneumonia, and an other and like other diseases. The second one up is red tide. So these are these algal blooms. It's when these toxins are actually absorbed by the seagrass and they grow on the blades of the seagrass, which the manatees feed upon. And back in 1996, red tide actually was responsible for 150 manatee deaths. The third one on there are human related threats and sadly the majority of manatee mortalities are due to human related threats. So first one on there is boat strikes. Um, this is the leading cause of deaths in of manatee deaths in Florida. So the slashes of the propeller will not only leave scars, but they can actually kill these manatees. Um, like we were discussing in the beginning with that anatomy of the manatees, their, their lungs are right at the top, they have all their organs and it's, it's really detrimental. Um, FWC actually reported just last year that 136 manatees died after being struck by a boat, so. Next on this list is pollution. Um, pollution in the sense of water pollution, and that's from pesticides, herbicides, detergents. This also includes uh, storm water runoff into our waterways, and lastly, oil spills. So anything that's going into the water that's gonna penetrate those seagrass beds or just gonna penetrate the manatees as they're swimming through the water is detrimental to them. Another one on this list, unfortunately, is harassment. And that refers to any act that changes the manatee's natural behavior. So touching a manatee, riding a manatee, as well as feeding manatees or even giving them water from a hose is considered harassment. So feeding or giving them water disrupts the manatee's natural habitat and it conditions them to take food or water from people. Um, Manatees are very docile and they're charismatic species, like Anna had said. And sometimes they're so cute and cuddly that you just want to feed them and you want to give them water because they love fresh water. But unfortunately, these are mammals. And if they get used to that condition of, well, I see a human and he gives me food and gives me water, they're going to keep approaching these boats. They're going to keep approaching these people. And they could either get hurt by the boat strikes, but also people try to feed them things that they're not supposed to eat, like a chocolate chip cookie or you know, a soda, things that manatees will not find in their natural habitat. So harassment is actually another big thing. Next up is actually flood control structures. So unfortunately, they can actually be crushed in floodgates and canal locks. And these are typically in place so they can prevent water intrusion and flooding. But what happens is, is that a manatee, imagine a calf, will get stuck in some of these areas and it commonly leads to drowning incidences. 
Next up is loss of habitat. So due to the growth of the human population and its added pollution, boat traffic, et cetera, it has degraded or even eliminated a lot of these feeding grounds for manatees. So back to their diet, they're eating 10 to 15% of their weight a day. So they need to have an abundance of seagrass beds just so they can feed on and stay alive. So losing uh, their habitat is going to be detrimental to them because that's where they feed, that's where they live, and that's how they stay alive. Next up is climate change. Believe it or not, as temperature and sea level rise, the seagrass beds are their primary food source. So these manatees are impacted as well as the seagrass. So if the seagrass doesn't grow quickly enough to, stay, to sustain these animals, then the manatees have nowhere to eat and nowhere to feed on. Um, another issue is that when these warmer waters increase, the occurrence of red tides and algal blooms increase. And again, that ties back to what we were talking in the beginning, it's gonna get into those seagrass beds and then that's not gonna be good for them to eat. And last on our list of threats is marine debris. And that consists of what everybody knows, those plastic bags, string, rope, fishing hooks, wire, paper, cellophane, sponges, rubber bands, the list goes on and on. But one of the main ones that's really hitting these manatees is monofilament fishing line. It's the most common one. So this fishing line will wrap around their flippers, around their fluke, and can actually start penetrating into their organs or cause loss of limbs. So it's very bad overall. And since these manatees actually travel to these canals and a lot of these near shore areas, they're going into these areas where it accumulates a lot of marine debris that's being washed in by wave and tidal action. All right, enough grief. That was, that was the, the hardest slide to go through, but um, there is legal protection for these beautiful critters. So manatees in Florida are actually protected under two federal laws. The first one being that marine Mammals Protection Act of 1972 and the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Manatees are also protected by the Florida Manatee Sanctuary Act of 1978. Um, these manatees actually have been a long-term endangered species and little by little in placing these legal protections, they're trying to bring back that population. So a little bit about conservation. First up, we have the Florida Manatee Recovery Plan. And it is coordinated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. It set forth a list of guidelines and they gear it toward recovering manatees. So in these guidelines, they've actually made development of site-specific boat speed zones, like in that image before, implementation of management plans, posting of the speed in specific areas. So they'll put signs in certain areas where they know a, there's a lot of boat traffic, but B, a lot of manatees are feeding in that area because there's lots of seagrass beds. And they've also um, set aside sanctuaries um, for these manatees. And with that, they've been able to do manatee research and education and public awareness programs. So that's that first um, plan up there. Second up is the FWC manatee program. And this just helps enforce those Florida laws and protect the manatees and bring awareness and raising money um, with that manatee license plate. Third up is the Save the Manatee Club. It is a nonprofit organization that was actually established in 1981 by Jimmy Buffett and former US Senator Bob Graham. Their mission was to protect manatees and their aquatic habitats for future generations. But what's cool about the Save the Manatee Club is what they're mostly known for, which is their Adopt a Manatee program. So you get to adopt 
quote unquote, a manatee, and the funds will go towards public awareness, education, research, rescue, rehabilitation, and release efforts um, for these manatees. And lastly is the Serenian International. It's another charity and they help conserve not only manatees, but actually dugongs as well. And similar um, aspect, they do educating through public and supporting research and conservation. Next up, so if there's any slide that you need to pay attention from out of this whole presentation, this is the one. If you see a injured, sick, dead or tagged manatee, you wanna call that number on the screen. That's the FWC hotline. Um, and apparently they even have a channel. So if you're ever on your boat and you have the marine radio, you can use that channel. Sometimes for instance, in the picture there, I actually responded to a, a dead calf um, stranding, but the first thing I did was call that FWC hotline and they're able, they'll come out and they handle the situation. But one thing that you guys should um, look out for are actually manatee tags. So there's a research study that's conducted by the US Fish and Wildlife Service along with the US Geological Survey Serenium Project and Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So they place these satellite tags um, as a belt. So if you see that it's a belt literally around the fluke of the manatee and it has, it just tapers off into that satellite tag. And what they're able to obtain from it, it doesn't harm the manatee in any way, shape or form. They can function fully within, swim along. Um, but it's actually providing data on the manatee's movement and their habitat. So last up are research programs that are actually conducting research studies at the moment. The Manatee Individual Photo Identification, that MIPS, it started off in 1978 by the USGS, so it's the US Geological Survey, and they've actually documented more than 3,000 manatees. Their focus is manatee distribution, survival, and reproduction. Within that, they actually also do a manatee health assessment and biomedical um, studies. And that's where that survey comes into place. With the synoptic survey program, they actually do aerial studies. So um, if you notice in a lot of these photos, there's drone footage and that's the new technology as to how we can actually do aerial studies from above. Next up is the Manatee Research Program, or MRP. It's year-round studies that consist of manatee behavioral ecology, distribution, habitat use, genetics, and the population status in Florida. Um, they actually assist with that top program, MIPS. So the data that they're getting from their program is actually assisting with that photo identification program. And last up is the Studies Investing Reproduction, Energetics, and Nutrition of Serenia, or SIRENS is the acronym. Their focus is on the metabolic rate with maturation, growth, seasonal changes in their thyroid hormones, their body composition, and just overall the physiology of the species. So before I start this video, I do wanna say thank you um, to Mario Cisneros. He actually provided um, the majority of the images and the footage you're going to see now. And also to Crystal Espinosa, she provided a whole subset of pictures for you guys today. Conservation of this species starts with us. And simply by taking photos and videos, we're able to show the world why we should care about manatees and provide insight into how important they are for our South Florida ecosystem. So, I hope that a message from this presentation is that A, you love manatees more than you ever really did before, and B, that we just need to protect and conserve these species.
All right, and just to end you guys off, Manatee Appreciation Day is the last Wednesday of March and South Florida celebrates Manatee Awareness Month during the month of November. Real quick, everyone, Sarah's going to put her contact info up on the screen. If you would just please take a moment to complete the poll that you should be viewing, all you need to do is use your mouse to indicate your choices. And this is anonymous, so please feel free to answer, answer openly, answer honestly, and scroll all the way to the bottom. There are three questions. And then once you have answered that, please hit submit. And the first question reads, Please indicate your level of agreement with the following statement. I learned something from participating in this webinar. The second question, just to, for clarity's sake, we're asking how many people were watching the webinar and that's not to say that we're asking you to try and guess how many people or count the list on your screen. We're simply asking you for a count of who is with you physically in your home or your office right now viewing the webinar. We're going to let that go for another few minutes. And it's just at 1230. So if you do need to leave, no problem. We're going to be staying on with Sarah to take questions, have a little Q&A session with her. I want to thank her very much. This was her first presentation in conservation conversations and she did a fabulous job and I want to also forgive me if I didn't mention it earlier I wanted to thank all of our veteran participants for attending another webinar and also welcome and thank all of our first time attendees as well we hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll consider joining us again on the second Wednesday of every month at 12 p.m. and Ed is going to be dropping a link into the chat box where you can find a list of this year's topics and registration links. And for the webinars that have already occurred, the registration links will be changed to the recording. So with that, we're going to ask Sarah to turn on her camera and we'll begin with our question and answer session. We've already got a few. All right, Sarah. And I suspect there's a great amount of support from the Ortiz family. So we want to thank, <laughs> we want to thank all of them as well, because that's really wonderful. All right, Sarah, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. And, and if we didn't mention it before, we are here for you, everyone. So if there are questions that can't be answered immediately today, please contact Sarah and she will do her best to follow up. And as I like to say, if she can't answer it, she will either make it up or direct you to someone who can. Absolutely. So like Anna said previously, I will send a follow-up email. And in that email, I'll actually put a, a link of there's conservation um, programs and all the other research programs. So if you guys are ever interested um, or if you feel free, like reach out to any of them. Um, there are a lot of organizations doing a lot of amazing work. So it's, it's incredible that just one species, everyone loves so much. <laughs> All right. Well, the first question that came early in your presentation was from our friend and avid viewer, Anthony, who is trying to stay warm in Massachusetts. <laughs> Anthony was asking if there are more manatees on the Gulf Coast or on the Atlantic coast of Florida, if you happen to know? So I would say, um, so manatees, believe it or not, are a migratory species. So it all depends on the season. So um, right now I would say the Gulf Coast, the Gulf Coast has more, um, but it, it again, it depends on their pattern. So these manatees are following that, um, the temperature and wherever they can feed. All right, so we have a question from Marsha for the next one. Um, what are the effects of poor water quality having on their food supply? Are we humans preparing to supplement their diet in case of habitat breakdown? 
that's something that's very hard. So um, back to that diet slide, um, these manatees feed on not only marine vegetation, but they're also feeding on freshwater vegetation. So in order to replicate that in a lab setting is hard, but I think that there could be research projects similar to like the coral reef restorations where there would be like a seagrass bed restoration where they're able to replenish these um, habitat loss areas. And I'm, I'm gonna add to that, Sarah, you're absolutely right. There are different restoration activities going on, but with respect to the changes to their habitat and potential loss of food source, even though manatees are, are largely herbivores, they do adjust depending on what's available around them. There have been lots of reports of manatees chewing on fish carcasses, yummy. <laughs> and so they've been known to adapt to what they have around them. And I've also witnessed manatees eating leaves from low-lying mangroves near their habitat. Okay. So there, there seems to be evidence that they can, that they can adapt, whether it's because of they have to, or if they're just simply opportunistic and taking advantage of what they might have near them. Yeah. Cool. All right, we have another question. There are a bunch that were really similar, so I'm gonna clump them together. Okay. It's a two-parter. The first is that are sharks a threat to manatees in the same way that they might be to dolphins or other marine mammals or reptiles? And do manatees have any enemies or predators? So sharks are another unique species. Um, it all depends on their food source. So if a bull shark is not getting enough food, it, it might pick out a manatee, but um, the chances of that are, are very rare and most likely not. Um, in terms of their threats, um, there's really no species that really wants to go at manatees. Um, apparently, the only one that's really causing detrimental effects are humans. But um, yeah, I hope that answers in any way. Great, Sarah. Thank you. Another question is, do we know why male manatees take so much longer to reach sexual maturity? And do manatees stay in the same groups throughout their life after they leave their mother? So there's no, the, the research paper, I can actually send you that one on like their sexual maturity. There was no specific reason as to why at like nine years old, um, I guess maybe that's the way the, that's around the period um, when they reach sexual maturity. Um, and that second question, um, what was it again? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what did I say? Oh, do manatees stay in the same groups throughout their life after they leave their mothers. Oh. So they're actually known to be, they wanna say they're solitary, but they're not, they're semi-social. So um, like if we see all those drone pictures and like footage that Mario got and they're kind of in groups. So. The reasoning behind it apparently is that they're either going to the same area to feed, um, but typically the that calf or like their actual offspring will stay with them only for a few years. And then apparently they're supposed to go on their way and um, you know meet the mating herd and then do the whole circle. So that's, the, that's why they're doing those um, satellite tags on the manatees because they kind of want to see um, first, where, where are they going? Where, which waters are they inhabiting? And second, um, are, there, are they going to the same spots? Or are they going with the same group of manatees? So there's actually a lot of studies being done in terms of their like patterns and their distribution. Great. So um, Sarah, so the next question is regarding that uh, program, the identification program, the photo ID program. Um, can the public, I know that was, you know, research organizations 
uh, looking into that and doing most of the photo ID, but can the public send in photos of manatees uh, to this program? Is it open? To I think so. Um, I will send the link to it and it's with the US Geological Survey and they have this whole subset of programs and it's actually really cool. So they have their, their coolest one is their statewide aerial survey. And I think they do have public involvement. So I, I'll send that link in the email and just make sure you're, you're looking for that. Um, it's like synoptic survey program. Perfect. Awesome. All right, next question from Richard. Do manatees still aggregate in the winter season near power plants, such as those in Riviera Beach and Fort Lauderdale? Yes, unfortunately. Manatees are a creature of habit. It's part of their mammalian instincts. And um, yeah, so anywhere where it's like nice fresh water and they're getting that outflow, they're going to end up there. And that's why the whole list of threats is going to affect them because they're going to these areas consistently. Great. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, this one is uh, how to experience manatees. What is the best way to experience manatees in an ethical and responsible manner? Okay, so if you see that picture, I'm actually paddle boarding and this was actually in Virginia Key. Um, there are a lot of places where you can just, if you, you can kayak, you can swim, you can paddle. What you wanna do is you wanna give them their space. You want them you wanna see them in their natural habitat. You wanna see them feeding on the seagrass. You wanna feed, you wanna see them with their young. So you can do everything, just just do it like now with COVID standards, just six feet away. I would say that. So awesome. <laughs> it sounds like the six foot, we're gonna be keeping the six foot distance going for quite a while. Yeah, and so just them. treat it the same with animals and that's it. <laughs> and to, to follow up on Sarah's great answer, there are opportunities in which you can legally get in the water and, and observe manatees. And those are most frequently up in the Crystal River and Homosassa Springs area up in North Central Florida. And you are permitted to book a tour or an eco tour with an operation that is legally allowed to run these experiences and in which all of the rules and, and regulations are observed. And that includes, you are, you are allowed to sit there and float in the water. You are not allowed to use fins. If the manatee approaches you, you may extend out one hand to touch it, but you may not pursue it, massage it, hug it, kiss it, et cetera. No so, harassment. <laughs> <laughs> there are opportunities and it would be really interesting to see what the economic impact of manatee related tourism is for our state because it's a pretty accessible experience that you can participate in. So I'm sure that's been studied at some point or another. It actually brings in millions of dollars, Anna. And that's one of the reasons why they set forth those um, the sanctuaries because they knew, like the state knew, it's bringing in a large revenue just to see this species. Perfect. Awesome. All right. I think, did I miss a question from Mike? No, I think um, we're good with that. He just wanted to offer, uh, he has some great oh. footage of manatees, I'm sure. Um, oh. Sarah would love to, we'd all love to see it. Yes. So. By so, all means, email it to me. I would love send to see it. Over it. To Sarah and we will uh, we'll check it out. Thanks, Michael. Awesome. But again, guys, um, if you have any other questions or like, we, I am going to send all those links. Feel free to email me if you have another question you want me to answer privately, by all means. And um, stay up to date with our Facebook and our and Instagrams. Miami Eco Adventures posts a lot of uh, cool animal stuff all the time. So it's always nice. And if I can, I'll, I'm also going to put in a shameless plug here. In addition to paddling opportunities that are offered by the Virginia Key Outdoor Center on Virginia Key, Miami Eco Adventures runs a whole slew of various eco tours, clear kayaks, paddling, Coral Gables Waterway, Crandon Park, and there are lots of available opportunities to 
be able to view manatees locally here with these naturalists like Sarah and Ed who are providing, and I'm sorry, Crystal, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to not give a shout out to Crystal, but who are providing these tours. So definitely reach out to any of us and we can get you information about that as well. So thank you everybody. We look forward to seeing you next month, March 10th, where Ed will be presenting on wading birds of Southeast Florida. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ed. Thank and you, guys. Look forward to seeing you all in a month. Take care.